Okay, so let me remind you what we did last time. We kind of got ourselves set up by describing a wave. Um, we will mostly focus on what we call periodic waves. Um, periodic waves repeat over and over again, and so the way we quantify the repeating unit is wavelength. We quantify how far they deviate from the medium's uh, natural equilibrium by something called the amplitude. Uh, we define two quantities that a fixed observer watching the wave pass by might want to talk about, frequency and period. They're just ways of flipping the question on its head. Period talks about uh, how long it takes for a wavelength to pass, and frequency talks about how many of them pass per second. They're just reciprocals of one another. And then at the end of last time, we talked about the wave speed, which for a wave on a string, depends on the tension in the string, as well as the mass per length of the string. So if you want to call it fancy linear mass density, it's just the string's mass over its length. And I made a kind of big point about talking that that only depended on the medium, the stuff the wave travels on. So if you want to know how fast the wave travels, you need to know about the stuff it's traveling on. So for instance, if you want to know about the wave on a string, you need to know about the string. The wave speed depends on the medium. It does not depend on the amplitude of the wave, the wavelength of the wave, the frequency. None of the wave properties matter. What matters is the, um, the stuff it's traveling on. And we pointed out that uh, we kind of motivated this formula by talking about the individual particles. The individual pieces of medium do not move along with the wave. They actually move up and down in simple harmonic motion. So even though the wave speed might be constant, what I call Vy, which is the part of the medium, that is not constant. In fact, it's the classic profile of simple harmonic motion. So I'll show you momentarily an applet um, that will hopefully encapsulate all, uh, most of this. But first I want to show you uh, one of the more important relationships between these variables. So what I'm going to do, since the wave is moving at a constant speed, I'm just going to apply distance equals rate times time, basically. So a familiar equation that we used when we were doing projectile motion, right? For the horizontal direction, gravity doesn't accelerate horizontally, so this is basically distance equals rate times time. So let me apply it to the wave. Now obviously, we have to pick a point on the wave. So we'll just pick a, a point here, that one. And we'll ask, how fast does that move? Well, it moves so fast that one wavelength will pass this point in one period. Right? That's the definition of a period, right? It's the time it takes one wavelength to pass. So if you measure a crest, you start your timer then, you stop it at the next crest, that's one period, and how much has how much of the wave has passed by? Exactly one wavelength. So one wavelength, by definition, passes in one period. And of course, we don't call this Vx because we were usually just referred to as V, the wave speed. Um, the only other thing I want to do to modify this is I want to substitute in for the frequency instead of the period. So we talked about last time the reciprocals of one another, so let's just throw that in there. This is 1 over f. And if I bring it to the other side, I get this equation. It's a very important equation that's uh, for waves of any kind. Okay. So let me talk about what this equation means. First of all, it's an interrelationship between the wave speed, the wave frequency, and the wave length. And it seems to almost immediately violate one of the things I just told you, is that the wave speed depends on the medium, and here I have it depending on both the frequency and the wavelength of the wave, but that's not the correct interpretation. 
The V is determined by the medium. It's fixed by the medium. What this equation is saying is that the frequency and wavelength of a wave can't be just anything. The frequency and the wavelength have to multiply to this constant that's determined by the medium. So basically, the left-hand side, you can't do anything about it, but it tells you that if you have a high-frequency wave, it must be low wavelength on this medium. And if it's a low-frequency wave, it has to be a high wavelength. So the frequency and wavelength, you don't have free choice on those. In fact, once you've picked one of them, you've picked either the frequency or the wavelength, the other one is going to be determined for you because the two have to multiply to whatever wave speed the medium has. So, let me try to explain conceptually what is going on in this equation and why the frequency and wavelength have to multiply to a fixed value. So, in order to do that, let me just draw two waves. I'll draw one that has a long wavelength, so pretty long wavelength here, traveling along at a speed v, and I'll draw another one which is traveling at the same speed, but it's got a much shorter wavelength. So you can think of these like there are two identical uh, waves uh, traveling on, or so I said two identical strings. So the string is going to determine the wave speed, but I've chosen to put different wavelength waves on each string. So let's imagine that we're an eyeball in the sky here, observing, and we're going to measure the frequency of the, the waves. And again, I'll do it by crests. I like crests. Okay. So let's talk about frequency. Here you get crest, 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 right? The crests are going to pass by. Here I get crest, 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 crest. Is it, it's not because the wave's moving faster. It's because the crests are closer together, so they arrive more often, right? That's all. So here, because the crests are closer together, they're more bunched up, which of course means a low wavelength. They arrive more often, which means the frequency is higher. And that's all happening at a given wave speed. So V equals F lambda is just a mathematical way to enca encapsulate the common sense idea that when the crests are closer together, they're going to arrive more often. That's all. So if you don't have any say about how fast the wave travels, you've already fixed that by the medium, what it's basically saying is that if your wavelength is going to be huge, you're not going to see very many crests per time. So the frequency is going to be low. And vice versa, if the crests are closer together and the wavelength is low, then you're going to see them more often. The frequency is going to be high. That's all that this equation is saying. Okay? So with that, um, let me go ahead and try to show you this on the computer. I'll pull down the screen here. So here is a um, picture of a traveling wave. So the disturbance you can clearly see is moving to the right. Okay. Um, I also do have a particle, that red dot, imagine it's like I marked the uh, point on the string with a dot. That does not move from left to right. In fact, it just oscillates up and down. Right? I talked about that last time. Right? When you shake out a carpet, you don't shake the pattern off the end of the carpet. Right? So the stuff, it, the matter itself is not moving, it's a disturbance in the matter that's moving. So, um, what do I have? Um, so first of all, you can see this has a classic simple harmonic profile. It hits maximum speed when? It's the, the, um, the blue arrow is actually speed. Where does it hit the maximum speed? At the equilibrium. And where does it go to zero? It's turning around. Exactly. If the crest in the trough turns around. So that, right there, that's not constant velocity. 
If you want, I can go ahead and add a point here. Here's another point on the string. It's also doing the exact same simple harmonic motion, just a little bit later. And it turns out that that delay between one and the other, that's what carries the disturbance along. And the disturbance does move at a constant speed. Hopefully you can see that the disturbance is moving at a constant speed. So, those are some of the points that I talked about earlier. But now, notice here that I have sliders for wavelength and frequency. Okay? But, I also have this box here that says F lambda equals constant. So that box, of course, makes sure that the two always multiply to a constant, and I want it to multiply to a constant because the, that constant is the wave speed, and the wave speed is determined by the median. So that's basically saying is that whatever this is, this is of course a computer simulation, but I want it to represent something in the real world, and in the real world, if it's the same string, then the speed on it has to be the same. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, let me get a sense of the wave speed here, so it's going to be two, three, four, so it takes about four seconds to cross the screen, so that gives you a sense of the wave speed. Now let me start messing with the wavelength. So I'm going to drag the wavelength slider down and see what's happening to the frequency slider. It's sliding up, right, because the two have to multiply to a constant. So if I decrease the wavelength, then the frequency increases. You can see it vice versa. If I increase the wavelength, the frequency decreases. Okay? Now, it may not look like it, but this wave speed is still exactly the same. Let's find a crest here. One, oh, that's, that's not about the same. Let me try something that's a little easier to catch. So, one, two, three, four. One, yeah, this, I'm not actually that convinced this is programmed that well, but uh, it should take the same time to cross. Even though it may not look like it, it still has the exact same speed. So, one, two, three, four. Yeah, it's close. Okay. So even though I have a very low wavelength, right, the crest to crest distance is much smaller, and it also means that I get crest, 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 I get a much higher frequency, right? Low wavelength, high frequency. They still do multiply to the same value. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the kind of the idea of V equals F lambda. Okay. V is fixed by the medium, and then the frequency and wavelength vary inversely. So if one goes up, the other one goes down. And again, don't mistake the wave speed with the simple harmonic motion that's experienced by the points on the medium. Okay. Um, are there any questions on this before I? it down. I will uh, make this available to you also if you want to play around with it yourself. Um, I had a little bit of a hard time getting it to work because they, or they're on a new Java standard, so um, the, uh, I had a hard time playing this in my preferred browser, but I'll, I'll post it for you just in case you're a better computer than I am. Um, so the next thing we're going to do before too long, we should probably talk about not just waves on a string, but we should talk about sound waves. So um, let's talk about what we have to do to make a sound wave. Um, so it turns out that all the wave basics we learn here are going to, for the most part, apply. So sound waves. Let's catch up with that. So we talked about before the sound waves were longitudinal. In fact, I'll show you an applet here in just a moment where we can see it visualized. So what do we know about waves so far? Um, we know they have an amplitude, they have a wavelength, a frequency, we have a period. Um, we know they have a wave speed. 
We know frequency is one over period, that's still true. We know V equals F lambda, that's still true. Not a whole lot's changing here. V is set by the medium. That's still true. Though, of course, we do need to now, we, uh, the, whole, uh, the properties of a string being the tension and the linear mass density, those whole things don't even make sense for air. I know there's a saying, there's tension in the air, but you can't actually define tension for air, okay? Um, so we'll need to address that. Um, the other thing we do need to address is that since it's a longitudinal wave, uh, this, um, the, the amplitude needs some looking at. So if we have this and we call this the amplitude, well, that's not actually oscillating up and down anymore, right? The whole point of a wave on a string is that it's a, what we call a transverse wave, where the disturbance is perpendicular to the motion. This is not that anymore, okay? So um, now it's not a, mo a vertical motion with a horizontal, or sorry, a, a vertical oscillation with a horizontal travel. Um, what happens now, let me show you a picture of this. We'll go back to the uh, applet here, or the computer. So here's a kind of a thing that will show you the difference between, just in case you forgot, I showed you this on a slinky last time. The difference between a transverse wave, like a wave on a string, and a longitudinal wave, like a sound wave. So here is a transverse wave, um, just like I kind of just showed you. So the wave travels to the right, but <laughs> the oscillation is uh, perpendicular to that, right? So the disturbance is a vertical disturbance that moves horizontally. There is a particle on the medium that you can see up, going up and down in simple harmonic motion. So they colored it just so you can kind of be able to focus on one part of the medium. Now what I can go ahead and do is switch it to a longitudinal wave. Um, and I can start that. There's my compression disturbance. And we are going to look at a periodic compression disturbance. So you can see that there's a compression disturbance that's moving along here, right? There's a compression disturbance. Okay. So the uh, disturbance is horizontal, which is the same axis that the wave moves on. You can notice, by the way, that there is still a particle on the medium marked, and it does still move back and forth in place. So just like before, it's the disturbance that's traveling across the screen, not actually a partic any particular part of the medium. Uh, let me show you a slightly better version of this. So here's a sound wave in a tube. So what we have is some kind of piston here that's moving back and forth, and it's creating regions of compression and expansion in the air. These are all air molecules. So when this thing pushes forward, it creates a region of high pressure, and when it pulls back, it creates a region of lower pressure. Now you can clearly see here, there's right here and here and here, you can see that there's disturbance moving along, right? See that? So there's these regions of compression that are moving, and they are equally spaced, right? We want to make a periodic wave. So we want to have them have equal spacing. You can actually measure the wave length, right? The, the compressed to crest would be about like this, right? See that? But I do want to point out also, Pick any one of your favorite particles here, this one for instance. It just goes back and forth in place. So while it's a disturbance that's traveling, it's not actually taking any air with it. Now that may be harder to visualize because we like to think that air can easily blow from place to place, right? The wind. But when you have a sound wave, it does not actually carry air molecules from one place to another. You can't. You can hear me talking just fine, you can't smell my breath, right? The actual molecules are not traveling from my mouth to your ear. It's a disturbance of the air between us, okay? 
Um, so your eardrum is reacting to that. So um, that's what it looks like going along a single dimension, and we do want to probably focus on that. Um, just like a wave on a string, right? A wave on a string, there's only one way for it to go along the string. Um, I just should, in full disclosure, show you what the sound wave I'm making right now looks like. It looks more like this. So it's a disturbance that's going on in all directions, so you guys can all hear me, right? You don't have to be standing right in front of my, my mouth, right? So this could be something that's pushing air, compressing it, pulling it back, compressing it. Um, this could be like a loudspeaker. This is what a loudspeaker does, right? You can see it moving back and forth if you turn the music loud, up loud enough, right? And it does go out in all directions. It's a spherical wave. So it's kind of like dropping a rock in a pond, right? The waves go out in all directions on the surface. That's a two-dimensional wave. Well, I'm making a three-dimensional wave. You can hear me wherever you are. You can even hear me when you're up there. Uh, you know, if you were above me or below me, you could hear me, right? So that's the essence. We're not going to touch things like this, but you should know, at least in concept, that that's what's happening. We're going to focus in on sound waves that are more traveling in a single direction, in an analogy with a single uh, string. Okay. So there are some um, uh, visualizations for you. And again, I'll post some of those for you if you want to take a look at them on your own as well. So. Let's talk about this. So, um, I'll try to represent what I just showed you there on the screen. That's a good thing I showed you a professional animation because I can't draw nearly that well. We have some kind of uh, uh, piston or diaphragm that's moving back and forth. It's going to create regions of compression. And then there'll also be, in between, regions where the air is more sparse, right? You can't compress over and over again if you don't pull back, right? So you have to push and then also pull the piston. The regions where the uh, air molecules are more sparse are called regions of rarefaction. So the mnemonic is, it's rarer to find an air molecule in a region of rarefaction. Okay. These particles all oscillate in place like that. And one of the ways we can describe the uh, oscillation is in terms of this distance, right? So if we take a given air molecule, we can measure how far to either side it goes. Now, we could call that A like we used to, but we usually like to reserve A for transverse waves. So now instead of A, I like to call it S. So I'll call the amplitude now S max. So I'll call this displacement amplitude. Okay. So that's literally talking about how uh, much the average air molecule oscillates back and forth. But there's another way to describe what happens. Let me kind of draw here below a schematic of the pressure variation. My equilibrium is, of course, going to be atmospheric pressure. So if I hadn't put a sound wave into the air, it would just be at atmospheric pressure. And then, in the regions of compression, is obviously high pressure, and then the region of rarefaction is lower pressure. So it might look like this. So there you can see we have a wave that looks very similar to the wave on a string we were talking about before, except it's not literally an up and down oscillation. This, what I have on the vertical axis is a pressure variation, right? So this is going to vary between a maximum pressure and a minimum pressure. So when you compress the uh, piston on the end, the loudspeaker diaphragm, 
you're making a region of maximum pressure, and then when you have to pull back, you cross a minimum pressure, and then you repeat the process over and over again to make your periodic wave. In fact, the amplitude now is basically the gauge pressure, right? It's how does the pressure vary from atmospheric. So I can actually talk about it as P gauge. That's your pressure amplitude. So there's actually two different ways to describe the amplitude when you're talking about a sound wave. You can talk about it literally as the oscillation of the air particles, the S max, how far they move. Or you can talk about it as a pressure variation. Okay? So now we can understand why you can hear these signals, right? Here you have your ear, you have your eardrum, and of course you have most of the time, if you haven't been flying around in planes, you just have atmospheric pressure to one side, right? Or you have atmospheric pressure on the inside of your ear, right? What happens when a crest arrives of maximum pressure? Which way does your eardrum get pushed? Inside. Get pushed from, it's always, the force is always from <coughs> higher pressure to lower pressure, right? What about when a trough arrives, a minimum pressure, below atmospheric pressure, which way does it get pushed? So the other way, always from higher pressure to lower pressure. And so your eardrum will get vibrated, and that's what your brain interprets as sound, right? That pressure variation is pushing against the inside pressure of your eardrum, which is constant. Does that make sense? Have any questions on that? Okay, so I guess the word on units, what do you think you measure a displacement amplitude in? meters, right? Now, just to tell you, the uh, typical, like, the way, what you're hearing right now, the sound that I'm making, the actual motion of the air molecules is like a nanometer. It's incredibly tiny. Well, you've been around, we've evolved on this planet for a long time, so being sensitive to sound is a good thing, right? Um, what do you think we measure pressure amplitude in? Pascal is like any pressure, right? So you can describe the sound wave in both pictures, right? All right, so that's one thing. If we have, uh, we kind of remade the amplitude a little bit, so we have to now liter not literally think of it as an up and down oscillation, it's a compression disturbance along the same axis as the wave motion. The other order of business we have is to talk about what sets the wave speed, what sets the speed of sound in a material. So, um, let me give you the formula just for, um, uh, for reference. I'm not going to have you do a whole lot with it. So, let me compare it to the wave on a string. So, wave on a string, the equation was this. And it turns out that all wave speeds basically um, fall into some kind of general category like this where it's the square root of something uh, in the numerator talks about the restoring agent, right? So uh, in the case of the wave on a string, it's how hard the string is pulled tight, right? Because that tells you how fast the string can snap back, right? To equilibrium. So there's some kind of restoring uh, term up there, and then there's some kind of inertial term on the bottom. So for instance, uh, mu is the mass per length. It talks about how much inertia is contained in one bit of string. Well, for a sound wave, the restoring term, how fast the material snaps back, is something called bulk modulus, okay? So this is not buoyant force, it's bulk modulus. And I don't really expect you to know a whole lot about that. Just understand that if the material is more stiff, then the bulk modulus is more stiff, okay? So if a material really doesn't want to like change its uh, shape, right? It doesn't want to carry compressions or 
or um, regions of rarefaction, then the bulk modulus increases. And then the inertial term now isn't some weird mass per length or linear density, it's just the density of the material. So, let's make a comparison of different things, okay? Um, so let's start with gases. So, uh, for instance, if you plug in these values for air at sea level, so that's atmospheric pressure, and room temperature, and of course you probably know from chemistry that the pressure and temperature of a gas have a lot to do with how dense it's going to be, you will get that, the, that this comes out to be 343 meters per second, which, of course, you measured in your speed of sound lab several weeks ago. Hopefully got something that confirmed this. Yes, remember that lab? Mm -hmm. We have you do it a little bit early just because there's not a whole lot to it, right? You're just basically bouncing the echo off the back of the tube, right? Distance equals rate times time. So for air, it works out to be that. Um, let's take a look at, say, liquids and solids. Now, liquids and solids, generally speaking, are they more dense or less dense? More dense. So if they're more dense, what would that tend to do to the speed of sound? Slow it down. Okay. So. If you have liquids and solids, they just have more stuff to them, so they, it's harder to slosh them around in a wave. However, are liquids and solids more stiff or less stiff than a gas? More. Way more stiff, right? So you can easily uh, compress gas into a smaller space. Liquids and solids do not like to have them, uh, so they're way more stiff. Okay. In fact, we pretended that for liquids and solids, we pretended that their density is approximately constant because they're incompressible. Right? So they're approximately... So it suited us in the fluids unit to pretend like the density wasn't negotiable at all. Right? We, the density... Water is so stiff that its density basically cannot be negotiated, right? That was our whole assumption. But as you probably know, that can't quite be true. If you smash water hard enough, it can be compressed. It's just extremely stiff. Here we do have to relax our requirement that liquids and solids are incompressible because if they couldn't carry, if they couldn't compress, they couldn't carry a wave, right? The whole point of a wave is that it's a region of compression. Okay, so now we're going to have to relax our requirement that their, their density is completely non-negotiable so that they can carry waves at all. So it's not that they're perfectly stiff, they're just very, very, very stiff. And if it's more stiff, then the material, when that sound wave comes through it, it really doesn't want to be there, right? The material snaps back, okay? And if that material really snaps back, then the wave had better move on. So if the B is larger, what happens to the sound wave? It goes faster, right? So here we have a situation where these two factors don't agree on which way the sound speed should go. So we have to go to the numbers. We have to say which one matters more. Is it the fact that the liquids and solids are more dense, so the wave speed would tend to slow down? Is that the dominating thing? Or is it that liquids and solids are so much more stiffer that the wave travels faster. And here I have to tell you that this factor wins. Okay? So while a liquid or a solid might be thousands of times more dense, it's millions of times more stiff. Okay? So it turns out that the speed of sound in liquids and solids 
is generally much, much greater than in gases. Okay? Sound waves travel very fast in liquids and solids. Yes, they're more dense, but the fact that they're so resistant to compression means the sound wave has to really get on out of there and keep, keep moving along. So if you ever see in those old cowboy movies, you see the Native American put their ear to the ground, it's a good idea. You'll hear it there first. Anything, that event that happens, sound will travel faster through the ground than through the air. Okay? Um, any questions on that? Okay. So, um, that's a little bit about the speed of a wave. And again, remember it's always determined by the properties of the medium. The one formula that I'll have you do computations with is this one. So that one, uh, just good old familiar terms, right? Tension, that's F is the tension. We've been working with tension for a long time. The mu is the mass to length. I'm not going to have you do anything with this formula right here. If you see physics later on, you might need to um, use this. Um, for those of you, for instance, if you do ultrasound, right? So if you're like an ultrasound tech, um, you may uh, need to be aware of the fact that if you have harder tissue, then the sound will travel faster through that. The softer tissue, it will travel slower, okay? So the more stiff it is, the faster wave will generally travel, okay? Because usually the stiffness dominates over the density. Um, and then for the speed of sound, you can go ahead and just use this value, okay? So just grab the value off the equation sheet and just use it. Anytime you have sound in air, you can count on that being the case. Right? So that's kind of your wave speed tour of the wave speeds. There's not much to it. Basically, these two right here. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is um, loudness. So one of the things we talk about uh, sound is... Uh, is its pitch, and the other one is its loudness. So we should probably talk about how that is measured. So for sound, we talk about its pitch, and we talk about its loudness. So Pitch is whether it's a high note or a low note, right? Treble or bass. Higher note, lower note. Pitch is just frequency, okay? So, so, so if it's bass, it's a low frequency. If it's a treble, it's a high frequency, right? In fact, every musical note has a frequency. Middle A on a piano, bing, 440 hertz, okay? And maybe if you have an instrument, you want to tune it, you get a tuning fork, and it says so and so many hertz right in the bottom, okay? This tuning fork is this many hertz. The loudness of a sound is measured by a property called the intensity. The intensity, we haven't seen this quantity quite before, but what it is, it's measured in watts per square meter. Now a watt itself is a unit of power, right? A watt itself is a joule per second. So basically loudness is a measure of energy per time per area. So how much energy is being carried by this wave to you per second per square meter, right? You have some kind of catcher that's going to also catch the sound, right? You have an eardrum that has a certain amount of area. Certain animals have bigger or smaller eardrums, and that matters too. So how loud something is determines about the energy arriving per second per area. Now, intensity is a brand new quantity, and I don't want to give you the full formula. I just want to tell you what it depends on. Intensity is proportional to the amplitude of the wave squared. Okay? 
Now, we, of course, said that you can describe the amplitude in two ways. Ways, you can describe it as a displacement amplitude or a pressure amplitude. And probably what I'll do is just generically refer to it as just A. I know I said I wouldn't use A for a sound wave, but that's kind of also my generic amplitude. And so what I want to point out is, is that even though it's a proportionality and not an equation, I can ask you things in a certain way so that you can answer. So for instance, if I have one sound wave that's like this, and I have another one which has twice that amplitude, if you double the amplitude, right, if A goes to 2A, what happens to the intensity? Four, Four times, exactly. So those are the types of questions that I will ask you. They're comparative questions. So I won't ask you to calculate the intensity from the amplitude, but I will say you have two sound waves. One is so and so many times more than this. How much louder is it? What is the intensity difference? Okay, so it's a square proportionality. Okay. So this is really it. Now you might question, is this really all there is to sound? Frequency and intensity? So someone that, who's a musician might say, well, wait a minute. You can play middle A on a piano and the same note on a flute and, you can, and at the same loudness. You can obviously tell one's a flute and one's a piano, right? So there's got to be something else. Well, it's not it's a new quantity. Here's the thing to understand. When you play a musical note, you're not really playing one note at all. Okay? So if I make a graph of frequency and intensity, you might think when you're playing middle A on a piano, 440 hertz, that you're basically just playing that frequency at some intensity, and then you just, how loud or soft you want to play that note is just going to determine how tall is that peak. If you ever actually hear just a 440 hertz uh, by itself, it's kind of grating. Like the signal generators on a computer can do this. Just, it sounds very annoying. Uh, when you actually play this note on a piano, it, you're not really playing this. Now don't get me wrong, this is the loudest thing, but there are other frequencies as well at different intensities. If your instrument is properly tuned, properly maintained, those other notes sound good with the note you're trying to play. They give it color, right? They kind of give it some more weight, so to speak. And so what these other things are gives the, the color to the sound. And there's even a name for this, it's called timbre. So it's what you can tell when you're playing the same note at the same loudness on a flute versus a clarinet. The difference is, is that while this peak may be the same, the secondary peaks may be completely different, and your ear can easily tell that those are there. Okay? So that's how you tell one instrument from another. In fact, if you have a tra highly enough trained musical ear, you can actually pick out what all those secondary notes are. There are certain opera singers where when they sing a note, and you can kind of uh, get this graph going on a computer, if they sing into the mic, they can actually move one of those peaks individually. That's how much control they have over their voice. So that's really all there is to it. It's what, are you, what note are you playing and how loud are you playing it. Any other things involved with music are just secondary. The color of the sound has to do with the fact that you're generally not making one note, you're making a whole set of them. And those are characteristic to the, the instrument that you are playing. Okay. Um, so um, the next order of business we have, I'm probably not going to have a chance to finish this today. Um, how loud something is, you probably have never heard watts per meter squared as described loudness. We normally use something called the decibel scale. So how many decibels is something? The decibel scale is a way to kind of, uh, it's a non-SI unit that's designed for being easier to work with for human beings. 
So we generally don't talk in intensity, we talk in decibels. Um, this is the SI unit, but this is a non-SI unit, and I'll go over on Monday how that works. Okay, so that's it for today.